continuing in the thought of the first message, talking of resurrection promise, we're now going to talk a little bit about resurrection power. Galatians chapter 2, I referred to it briefly before. <clears throat> we catch up with the Galatian church in the letter that Paul wrote to them. Now quite often when we think about Judaizers and, and we think about work salvation, we think of the book of Galatians because they had a big problem with works being drug into the faith. Usually my mind goes to these Galatians being bewitched and being drawn into works as a part of salvation. And as we've already unboxed a little bit, we see that when we're referring to justification, we're not always just talking about somebody being justified by, from their sins, but rather justified in, in the works that they do afterwards. And, and I believe Galatians is dealing with the same thing. Look with me quickly in Galatians 2 and verse 11. I'll show you what I mean. It says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Okay, so the Apostle Paul is now talking about his good friend Peter and how a time came where there was a dispute between them. And so the Apostle Paul felt it needful to, when they were together in Antioch, to, to the Apostle Peter's faith, face, withstand him with respect to this event. Verse 12, it says, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come... He withdrew and separated himself. So, he would always mix and mingle with the Gentiles. Had no problem with it, the Apostle Peter. But then when certain came from James and from the church which was at Jerusalem, the Bible says that Peter withdrew and separated himself from the Gentiles. Why? It says, fearing them which were of the circumcision. In other words, he didn't want to be caught mixing and mingling with the Gentiles and by the circumcision. He didn't want them to see that he had new friends of the Gentiles and he had spent all this time with them and fellowshipping with them. And so when the Jerusalem Christians showed up of James and from James's church, the Apostle Peter quickly separated himself. <clears throat> Verse 13 then, it says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise, with him. Now, a Jew is one of the religious sect of the Pharisees. The Apostle Paul, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, a little purposefully, he's calling Peter a Jew, <laughs> which is basically like saying, you're a Pharisee. You're, 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 you're not Christian in this act that you're doing. The other Jews, Peter included, dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly. So what were they doing? Walking not uprightly was separating themselves from the Gentiles. Behaving as Jews do in, in that aspect. Because we know that Juda Judaism is, is a very much racist religion. They, they're always calling the Gentiles the goyim. They want nothing to do with these impure people because they think that they're the chosen race, they're of a chosen bloodline, and so it creates this superiority complex among the Jews. And so the apostle Paul just straightly gives it to Peter and says, you're acting like a Jew, you're acting racist, you're acting prejudiced, you're having respect of persons in these things, and you're not walking uprightly, verse 14, according to the truth of the gospel. I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Why are you compelling the Gentiles to live like Jews do? Well, what does that mean? Look with me quickly back to verse 3, Galatians 2 and verse 3. It says, But neither Titus 
who was with me, being a Greek, so being a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. And so Titus, a Greek, and and born a Greek, and therefore not circumcised after the manner of Jews, was being compelled by these false brethren that crept in unawares, spying out the liberty that is in Christ Jesus, and tried to bring Titus and others into bondage. And that's what Paul refers to when he says, Peter, why are you compelling Gentiles to live like Jews? Why are you trying to then, in the same context, bring these Christians into bondage? Why are you trying to take them away from the liberty that they have, and rightfully so, in Christ Jesus? The Apostle Paul responded appropriately as Peter should have, and as those of James should have, in verse 5, when it says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So the Apostle Paul recognized that these are false brethren. They're bringing in um, these, these teachings to try to bring Christians into bondage, to try to take away the liberty that they have in Christ, to try to negate the truth of the gospel, And Peter was falling victim to it. And Barnabas was likewise carried about with this dissimulation of the Jews, the Judaizer. But the truth is, is that there is liberty in Christ. Verse 4, our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus should not be brought under bondage or under subjection to any of these doctrines brought in by false brethren. And he talks about them as being false brethren. But I believe that the bondage that he's talking about here is not them trying to bring works into salvation. These were already saved. These were already justified in the faith. And that's clear if you just look back in chapter 1. And in verse 2, he says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches which are of Galatia. So he's talking to brethren. He's talking to believers. Nevertheless, unbelievers came in and tried to mess with the liberty that is in Christ Jesus. What is this liberty that, I, that we have in Christ? I believe it's that we in our conscience can follow Christ as he leads. That's our liberty. That's our freedom. And Christ is going to take a conscience, which is essentially this word written in our hearts, And he's going to use the Spirit to draw different scriptures to our attention, teaching us to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us. And lo, he will be with us always until the end of the world. We have the preserved word of God here for us in paper. But also he takes that and writes it plainly in fleshly tables of our hearts upon our conscience so that we can, under the conviction of our conscience, the Spirit of God working with it, walk in liberty. We don't need to be brought into bondage of these ordinances. And that's precisely what Judaizers like to do. Bring you a list of to-dos and say, ye must this, 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 this. Well, maybe someone like Titus, who was born a Gentile, was not compelled by his conscience to be circumcised. And so therefore, when Judaizers came and they tried to bring him under the bondage of being circumcised, say, hey, you must keep this law in order to be saved, in order to be sanctified, in order to be right with God, Titus's conscience this didn't bear witness of that. And he is fully capable and fully at liberty to trust his conscience as led by the Spirit of God in matters of faith and practice. And so when they came and tried to compel him to the same, he said, no, I will not be brought unto this bondage. I will not fall victim to that. Unfortunately, some like Peter, some like those of James, and some like Barnabas were tricked, were brought into bondage, and had caused that the truth of the gospel didn't continue. The truth of the liberty of that gospel did not continue among this group, or at least in part. Verse 16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. And that connects 
justified by the works of the law to the verse 14 where it says, Jews, compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews. And that also connects with Titus, try, them trying to compel him to be circumcised. They are trying to create a religious sect where men believe they are justified by the works of the law. And not just in salvation, because these are saved people. He wanted to create a religion where people thought that they were justified by the works of the law, even in the area of sanctification. In other words, yeah, that's great. You have grace through faith. You've believed in Jesus. You're saved. But if you want to stay saved, you need to be justified by the works of the law, like circumcision, like keeping the Passover, like keeping the blah, 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 blah. blah. And they'll just keep adding to it. They'll just keep heaping this bondage upon those that are free in Christ. So he's saying here, why are you compelling, Peter, why are you compelling Gentiles to live as the Jews? Why are you compelling them to be justified or to believe they're justified by the works of the law? When verse 16 is clear, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but how? It says, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. That's an interesting verse there. I've read it through a few times over and over and over and over. It says, a man is justified. Essentially, it says, knowing that a man is not justified by work. So it's saying, a man is justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Right? Can you see how that's the, the language is saying that? It's, it's, it's saying you're not justified by works, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. You're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, and I believe that's your salvation, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. So it's saying a man is justified by the faith of Jesus. Even us who have believed in Jesus Christ and received salvation, we are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. This takes our salvation from that moment of time into the and, and our being justified by his blood into being justified by the works that we do in walking in obedience to Christ. Okay? So a man is justified not by the works of the law, but what? By the faith of Jesus Christ. We are justified by having faith in Jesus Christ. And when we give our faith to Christ, what is the promise that we learned in the first sermon? we give our faith to Christ, the promise is that he will do the works in us. We give him our faith and he does the works. The, the end result is kind of the same. Works are done. But the starting point is different. Okay? And the end point is different. The end of someone believing that they're justified by doing works is that they'll fall off the wagon. They'll miss up. They'll, they'll mess up. They'll mix up. They'll, they'll fall flat because we can't maintain good works apart from the Holy Spirit of God. The end result of the second is that we just keep giving God faith and God keeps doing works through us. God keeps growing us. God keeps strengthening us. Our faith is counted for righteousness. He imputes righteousness unto us. And that's the scriptural walk before our saving Lord. Justified, in other words, proclaimed righteous by the faith of Christ. And then he continues on in the second half. He says, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We may do works, but our works are simply us being justified by faith, and those works come as a result of the faith that we give to God. This is another one of those um, statements. If you remember 1 John 5.13, there's those two beliefs, and sometimes it's always pondered me. It's always made me wonder, what, why are they there? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, I've written these things to you that believe that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He's written unto those that believe that are saved, that are saved, that are that are right before God and have the peace of God and, and no more enmity. They believe, they're saved, they're on their way to heaven. He's written unto those that believe that they may know that they have eternal life. In other words, have assurance, have strong assurance and confidence and also that ye may believe. You've believed 
And I wrote unto you because I want you to believe further. And that's the whole thing that's being taught. And that's discipleship. <laughs> that, that's taking somebody that's saved and teaching them how to believe. It, it, discipleship, and we, we've seen that. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We tend to think discipleship as just do all of these things and you're a disciple. No, you follow Christ and he does the works. You give him faith and he does the works through you. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm writing to you that you and those that have believed because I want you to believe and have assurance of your saving faith. Now, we believe that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus. What is that faith of Jesus? What is the faith of Jesus Christ? In Galatians 2, verse 16. That's our action. The faith. Earnestly contend for the faith. When, when I go and act out my Christianity, I'm participating in the faith. This is the faith. The, the, the faith is, is us going to church. What is, what is my faith? People say, what's your religious faith? It's the faith. This is the only faith that is right. The only faith that is true. Pure religion is, is the faith. And it's undefiled before God the Father. Visit the fatherless and widows. Keep yourself unspotted. In other words, do right to others and do right in your walk. That's the faith. It's our actions. It's our activity. It's our life after salvation. That's Christ in me and me in Christ. That's the hope of glory that I have in this life is to walk in the salvation that he has provided. Walk righteously. So... Knowing a man is justified by the faith of Jesus, we have believed that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus. We believe in order that we may believe. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So it's our desire to walk in the faith of Christ Jesus. Give him faith, believe on him, trust him. Do what entail, is entailed in the, the faith as a whole. What is Christianity? What is it? That's what we want to, to be the output. We want our action, our activity to, to be encapsulated in what is determined as Christianity. This is the faith. Now, he asks this question because it sometimes comes to our mind. If, if, we're, if we're to be justified by our actions when we give Christ faith, then when we sin, is that just Christ ministering sin through us? No. Why? He asks here, if you're saved and you sin, doesn't that mean Christ is the minister of sin? If while we seek to be justified by Christ, while we, we seek to believe on Christ and have faith and, and, and be in the faith, we are found sinners, does that mean Christ is ministering sin through me? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> what has happened, though, is that for that moment in time, at the time of that decision, we weren't seeking to be justified by Christ. In other words, like we talked about before, when I sin as a Christian, it's because I haven't reckoned myself to be dead. It's because I haven't yielded my members to God so that he can minister through me. It means I haven't believed that the old man is dead and therefore not able to sin. It means I haven't trusted in Jesus in that moment. I haven't given him faith. I haven't reckoned myself to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. That's how I sin, is the moment I stop believing and trusting and following and seeking to be justified by Christ and seeking to serve Christ. Verse 18, he says, For... If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So our foundation when we're saved is Christ. The Bible says, Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid. But if I build thereupon wood and hay and stubble, if I build again the things that I destroyed, the things that died with the old man, the old man and his ways, if I build those things again upon the foundation of Christ, it's not because Christ is the minister of sin. It's because I made the decision to not follow Christ. I made the decision to not believe on Christ. I made the decision to not give Christ my faith and let him take hold of my members. I 
make myself a transgressor in that moment. It's not God that made me a transgressor. I chose that. It was my decision. And every day we have to make those same decisions. When I'm, when I'm brought to a temptation, do I reckon the old man dead and seek to live in the new man? Do I trust Jesus or do I trust in my own actions, in my own way, in my own thoughts and ideas? We have to decide that moment by moment, second by second. And when we do what is right, we are justified by Christ because we've believed on Christ, saw his word, reckoned it to be so, and made the right decision. When we sin, it's not because Christ ministered, it's because I made myself a transgressor. I decided to do wrong and I chose sin. Wood, hay, stubble, all those deeds will get burned up in the time of judgment. So what is proper and what should we do as Christians? How do we get this resurrection power in our lives? Again, believing, trusting, by faith, we need to follow what it says in Galatians 2 and verse 19. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Living unto God is what we need to do. Not sin, not self, not Satan. Live unto God as one dead to the law. Verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I am dead with Christ, even as he was buried. Nevertheless, I live. Rose again the third day with Christ. Because it says here, yet not I. So who's alive? Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, we need to understand this, the life that I'm living in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My life in the faith, my Christian life, my walk before God comes because I am dead Christ now liveth in me, and my life is only lived because of the faith that I give him. That's what the Bible here is saying. Verse 21, it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I do not despise. I do not reject. I do not set at naught. I do not cast off the grace of God. He says, For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So we had in the church a bunch of people that wanted to achieve, climb to, ascend to, grow in righteousness by keeping the law. And if our righteousness comes as a result of keeping the law, very clearly, then Christ died in vain. The Bible says that Jesus took the law away. The Bible says that he nailed it to his cross the moment that he died. He died in order, according to this verse, 21, in order that righteousness to those that believe no longer comes to by the law. Righteousness is imputed. Righteousness is received as a gift. Righteousness comes because I believed and he gave me grace. And any other way of being righteous, 10-step programs, you know, self-help books, trying to be a moral person, any other way of trying to be righteous is to despise the grace of God, to reject the grace of God, to set it at naught, to cast it off. If you're trying to live according to the law to be righteous, then Christ is dead in vain. Because he died in order that righteousness would not come by the law. Again, quickly, we see that this is not talking about gospel salvation and that's not the problem that's being muddied here in the Galatian church specifically, though there is an extra application for that. The problem with the Galatian church is that the life of the believers is no longer under the headship of Christ, but under the law. They have went from being under Christ's headship, following him by faith, believing in him to live through them, to now just making a list of laws to keep to be righteous. Do you know who did this to a fault? The Methodists. The Methodists wanted righteousness. They wanted their group, their sect, 
their Protestant um, group, and it maybe didn't start with the Wesleys, but it certainly grew into that. Here are ten laws that we must keep in order to be righteous. And it turned into a work sanctification. And do you know what it is today? A work salvation. It's like a back door to bringing works into the church. When everything that pleases God, everything that pleases God has to be of faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So, the Galatians couldn't be hoodwinked by a works salvation. They were saved. They had eternal life. They believed that. They're settled. But these false brethren entered in, privily spied out the liberty that they had in Christ Jesus, and started to teach works justified them, and they had to do laws, they had to keep laws in order to be righteous. And if that is the truth, then Christ died in vain. And Christ didn't die in vain. Christ died to the intent that he set forth when he died. We just have to reckon that. We just have to believe that. The life of the believers, even today, is being undermined. Our headship, that is Christ, is being undermined by works salvation, yes, but most of us won't be duped by that. But works sanctification will creep in and will cause you to be brought into bondage. It will cause that the truth of the gospel will not go forward. It will cause you to live as Jews and Judaizers, just trying to keep laws to be righteous. But I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'll show you what I mean because it continues on in this famous chapter of Galatians chapter 3. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth. And I believe that's the same truth of the gospel he's referring to, previous chapter, verse 14 and verse 5. Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? In other words, you've seen him crucified. You've understood the, the death of Christ and how it paid for your sins. But now it's resurrection time. Now it's time to grab hold of some resurrection power in order that you can live in the faith of Christ. Verse 2, this only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? That's your salvation. Did you receive the Spirit because you've done the works of the law or because you've heard and you've believed by faith? The answer is clear, by the hearing of faith. Okay, now the Apostle Paul is saying, okay, now let's continue on in this study. Verse 3, are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, so right, they received the Spirit by the hearing of faith. You began in the Spirit. Having begun the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you now complete in the flesh? Are you now living in the faith according to the flesh? Are you now a Christian, walking as a Christian? Are you now justified according to the flesh? Are you perfect by the flesh? Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, watch this. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit. And this is going to connect verse 2. The same type of question. He that ministereth to you in the Spirit. In other words, who is working towards you, doing good things, serving you in the Spirit of God, living that faith of Jesus Christ. He that is ministering to you in the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Your salvation was by the hearing of faith. And you're bewitched if you think now that all the works that you're doing afterwards are as a result of the works of the law. It doesn't make any sense. They go together. And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to connect in their mind. You've been bewitched. I know that you're saved. You answered correctly. They all would have answered correctly, I believe, in the Galatian church because they were saved believers in that congregation. When you got saved, was it because of the works of the law or the hearing of faith? They said, the hearing of faith. Okay, now why are you thinking you're made perfect as a result of keeping the law? Well, it's because you've been bewitched. No, 
the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of the servant of God, the ministry of the Christian comes as a result of the hearing of faith. And this is the crux of the matter because he's going to bring up another example, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And anytime you go and look up that verse, when Abraham believed God and had righteousness imputed unto him, it's usually because he's a saved man, trusting in God, doing godly ministry, doing godly works, believing God, and therefore able to live righteously in the resurrection power that God affords to his believers. Now you can... Quickly to the right, go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And again, I'll quickly read for you chapter 1 and verse 4. It says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have to all the saints. So the book of Colossians is being written to those that have faith in Christ Jesus and those that have love for the brethren. And that's how Christians show that they're Christians, is right? For your love for the brethren. One of the ways. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so just like he said in in, uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, he's saying, look, I want you to have full assurance. I want you to be knit together in love one with another. Understand the mystery of God and know him more deeply. Verse 3, he says, I want you to find all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge of Christ. And I want that for you. And he's praying for that for them. And for me, I mean, I would love to have a full assurance of understanding. When I read the Bible, I want to be fully assured that what I'm drawing from it is the truth. I know that that's truth. Why? Because the Spirit of God told me it's truth. I want to acknowledge, take knowledge of the mysteries of God. I want all wisdom and knowledge that is hidden in Christ to be made available to me. And the Apostle Paul is there praying for all of the Colossians and all of those at Laodicea that they would have that same assurance and understanding and wisdom and knowledge. Verse 4, he's going to tell them why he's saying these things. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Now is, is the beguiling here, again, just from the context, one of their salvation. No, I don't think so. He's writing to a church, a church that believes and has the faith of Christ, and also a church that loves one another. And he's saying of that church, I want you to have full assurance of understanding. I want you to know the mysteries of God. I want you to have wisdom and knowledge revealed unto you. And I'm writing this unto you, believers, so that you won't be beguiled by enticing words. These enticing words are drawing them not away from justification in their salvation, but rather from justification in their sanctification. He's worried, I believe, that they're not going to live that crucified life. They're not going to live that life in liberty with God. They're not going to live that life where their conscience is led by the Spirit of God. He wants them to be justified in the life that they're living And the only way that you can be justified in the life that you're living is the same way that you're justified in your soul. And that's by faith. He's worried that that this church that was a great church, a growing church, a budding church, a, a church that is ready to take the next steps into full assurance and understanding of the mysteries of God, he's worried that they'll be beguiled and start turning the faith into a religion, into a ritual, into a rigmarole of steps and to do's. That would be the worst thing that could happen to a great church like the Colossian church. Continue on in verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So the Apostle Paul knew that they had 
a great joy and a great spirit and a great order to their assembly and to their manner. And he recognized their steadfastness in the faith of Jesus Christ. And yet he's still worried that they could be beguiled. Verse 6, it says, And ye have therefore, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. That's key. As ye have received Christ Jesus, so walk. Again, how did we receive Christ Jesus? Galatians made it clear. By the hearing of faith. So walk in the hearing of faith. Don't be beguiled from this. This is important. As you receive Christ as a free gift through faith, by grace, through faith, so walk in him. Live out what God has worked into you by grace through faith. This is the Christian life. This is the Christian walk. It says in verse 7, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So, walk in Christ, by grace, through faith, rooted, built up in him. He's doing the works. He's doing the building. He gives you the water, the living water, so that you can set your roots deep, and then therefore be established, and even as you have been taught, abound in that same position with thanksgiving. Thankful, 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 thankful for all that God is doing in your Christian life. And Paul says, I'm saying this lest you should be beguiled with enticing words. Verse 8, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beware of the Judaizers and their laws that will beguile you. Beware of the philosophers and their logic that will beguile you. Beware of the scientists, falsely so called, and all of their facts, for those things will beguile you. And the philosophy and the vain deceit and the traditions of men will corrupt the good thing that you have there. And this is why the Apostle Paul is writing unto them. Beware of the philosophy that draws men away from the faith. Beware of the tradition that tries to give a order to the faith. Not after Christ. We need to be after Christ, therefore. Why? Verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and in him is the mystery of God, and in him is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden, and in him is the full assurance of understanding. And as you have received him, so walk in him, by grace through faith. And that's exactly what it says over in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. You can go there. Some of us might have it memorized. But he says there in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The life that you are now living, you live by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you, if you do not have the Son in this life, you have no life at all. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, the saved, that ye may first know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I've written unto you, believers, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God and have that assurance of eternal life being present with you. And that's the eternal life of your salvation, of course. But more than that, that's the eternal life that gives you resurrection power to be sanctified in his name by the works that he does through you when you give him faith. Verse 14 connects believing, that second belief, and it says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. He's saying, look, if you have the Son of God, you have life. If you know that you have eternal life and you believe on the name of the Son of God and the life that you have been given, you have confidence 
and you know him. Know you have life, believe on Jesus. You know what that builds? Confidence in a relationship with him. That means you're going to trust him more and more and more. It's fruit. You give God faith, he gives you growth. You give God faith, he gives you growth, and you start to build a relationship and trust with him so that when you ask him something, you know that he will give you the desires of your heart and you can be confident in that very thing. And the biggest thing that we should be asking God of, the biggest petitions that we need to be bringing to our God have to do with our life and how we live it. We have to bring to God, I'm struggling with this, I'm suffering with this, I'm tempted by this, and allow him to... Hear and give the petitions that you desire. And that will give you confidence. And that will make it so that you know that you have eternal life and the power that comes with his resurrected life. And you will also be able to believe on him more and more and more and more to the sanctification of your soul. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. It said, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we, wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted. It is for your consolation and for your salvation." So the Apostle Paul here is talking to, again, a church. This is the second letter to the church. He's not dealing with the salvation of your soul, but he's dealing with the sanctification and the growth that ought to come. He's saying, look, I'm suffering, and the sufferings of Christ abound in me, but it's to your consolation. It's to your salvation. It ought to bring you hope and encouragement, and, and that's what it does for me. The Apostle Paul says, look, I'm comforted in tribulation so that I can comfort you in tribulation. And you know what? When you're comforted in tribulation and struggling, it ought to be to the end that you can help another believer through the same things that they're going through. He's encouraging them to believe and to follow Christ despite all the things that they're going through. And blessed be God for His great mercies and all the comforts that He comforts us with. And He does so in order that we can comfort one another with the same comfort we received of him. Verse 7 continues and it says, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. So the hope that Apostle Paul is firm on is that he wants them to be comforted even as they're suffering. That's his desire for them. Verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, watch this, that we are pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Some people like to use that, that phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle. And that's not true. Because scores of saints have fallen to something that they could not handle. Even we in our personal lives fall to temptations once in a while. It was beyond what we could handle. Do you, do you know what he's saying here? The Apostle Paul is, is saying, hey, I'm, I'm pressed without measure. Above strength. In so much I despaired even of life. In other words, I did not have the strength to pull through what was placed before me. I was pressed out of measure. But he had comfort. Verse 9, verse nine shows it. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, there's a death sentence here. In other words, I can't trust in myself, is what he is saying, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Remember when we talked about the resurrection of Christ and how it gave us grace to stand and to rejoice and to glory in trouble. That's the promise. Here's where the rubber meets the road. When you're going through suffering, when you're going through struggle, you need to have the sentence of death in, in yourselves and just 
de- demand of yourselves that you will not trust in yourself, but in God which raiseth the dead. You are trusting in the God which makes the dead walk, which makes the blind to see, which raises up a dead corpse and makes it alive again. You are trusting in his resurrection power. Trust in the grace of the Lord. Trust in the gift that he gives us. Verse 10, it says, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver. He not only delivered us from this above strength, pressed out without measure, trouble that I had in Asia, when I despaired of my life and gave up. He delivered us from that and he's still delivering. Why? Because we didn't trust We didn't put faith in ourselves. We didn't put faith in a checklist. We didn't put faith in works of the flesh, works and deeds of the law. We're not trusting in our own righteousness, but we're trusting in God and His imputed salvation, His imputed righteousness. And here He's even imputing consolation unto those that give Him faith. He'll have grace to stand, rejoice and glory in trouble as it's placed before them. He continues on in verse 11. Ye also helping together by prayer for us and for the gift bestowed upon us by means of many persons, thanks may be given for many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this. So here's what he's joying in at the moment. The testimony of our conscience. That in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, We have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you. We need to let our conversation in the world be the testimony of our conscience. What is he saying here? In simplicity and in godly sincerity, my conversation in the world was not because of some fleshly wisdom that I've accumulated. My conversation, my works, what justifies me in the eyes of the world, according to James chapter 2, is as a result of the grace of God. And how do we receive the grace of God? As a free gift. By grace, through faith, That is what your conversation in the world is, and that is the testimony of your conscience clear before God. We need to trust in His resurrecting power, and that's what it says in verse 9 again. The Bible's talking a lot about this resurrection power. Verse 9 it says, But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. You know what that is? He reckoned Himself to indeed be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. I had the sentence of death in myself. The old man is dead. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. We should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. That is the resurrection power. That is trusting God to do great works in you, great works through you. That's how you get a testimony of a clear conscience as you follow God in simplicity and sincerity and your conversation that is seen is as a result of the grace of God working through you. And you receive the grace of God by faith. Go back and see Colossians in chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 it says, If ye then be risen. We are. But we got to reckon that to be so. we got to believe that. Have the sentence of death in ourselves. Though we will not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. And if ye then be risen with Christ, are you risen with Christ? Then you seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection. Set your desires. Set your prayers. Set your wanting. Set your hope on things above and not on things of the earth for here's the greatest reason ever ye are dead (laughs) set your affection on things above not on things on the earth for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God and he sits at the right hand of God so set your affection there set your heart there your desire there your love there when Christ who is our life 
Remember what First John said? He who has Christ has life. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. And if you are risen, if you've reckoned it to be so, and this is day by day, moment by moment, take some of these, ye are dead, I am dead. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. These need to be your power verses for powering through sins in your life and, and, through, and for getting resurrection power in your life. You need verses like these at your disposal. I've got the sentence of death in myself. I will not trust in myself, but on God which raiseth the dead. On God's resurrection power. Look at verse 17. Whatsoever ye do. And this is really just the symptom of being risen with Christ and setting your affections in the right place and reckoning your old man to be dead and the new man alive unto God. Reckoning it so. Believe it. Christ is your life. The life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 17, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Give him all the glory. Give him all the thanks. Why? Because he's the one that did the work. You just simply trusted him by faith and he worked through you. Why do you give him all the glory? Why do you give him all the praise and the thanks? Because he is the one, the Bible says, that both worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is him that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He is the one that justifies. And he is the justifier of all those that, the Bible says, believe in him. What a God we have. Seek him by faith and you all have access to his resurrection power. Thank you, Father.